So hello, I'm Larry Butler for the East Hawaii Cultural Center uh, in Hilo, Hawaii, where we currently have a, an erupting volcano. We're so happy. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce the members of Thing Thing. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, they are a design collective, an experimental design collective based in Detroit with deep ties to the Big Island. The work of Rachel Mulder, Simon Anton, and A.G. Jimbo focuses on site-specific exhibitions surrounding issues of waste, making, creativity, and place. In 2019, they were invited for a summer residency with the Temple Children here in Hilo, which culminated in a sculptural installation featured at our EHCC, and I remember that exhibition very well. It was wonderful. Next year, the EHCC is partnering with Thing Thing again with the County of Hawaii and the Temple Children for transforming trash, repurposing plastics to enhance public parkscapes and revitalize communities. It's going to be a collaborative youth art project in different parks around the Big Island. Thank you so much for being with us, the three of you, and thank you to our audience for uh, for joining us. We'll have time afterwards for questions. And I think now I'll just turn it over to you guys. And I guess, Rachel, you'll be doing the, the PowerPoint. Thank you so much. All yours. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'll just quickly reintroduce. I'm Rachel. I am currently practicing as an architect in New York City. Um, Simon. Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Simon Anton. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Uh, I am an artist and educator uh, in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I do a lot of work um, with grief support as well. So that's one of the ways that I express my creativity is doing grief therapy work. Uh, my name is Jimbo. Um, I have a background in architecture and landscape architecture. Um, and I'm currently based out of Seattle. Um, so we can get started. Um, let's go. The title of our lecture is Think, uh, Think Thing, Plastic Thinking. Um, and we have separated it out into three chapters. Uh, and first chapter is Discovery and Experimentation. Um, and this is kind of our origin story, uh, how we kind of, what brought us together and what our um, ideologies are. Uh, and then chapter two, objectness, uh, the objects that we brought into production after learning from that discovery and experimentation phase. Uh, and the last one, three, place, uh, and uh, some, we'll be kind of touching on the work uh, that Thing Thing has done in Detroit. And so let's get started. Uh, discovery and experimentation. Next slide. So how it started. Uh, back in 2012, we were a group of graduating architecture undergrads, uh, and we got hired to spend the summer producing uh, version two of a project made in Detroit for the 2012 Venice Biennale. Um, and in this process, we were seeking abundance, um, an abundant material, um, and we kind of landed on plastics. Uh, it's a ubiquitous material. It's everywhere we look. Um, and where others saw nuisance uh, of a trash burdening the city, um, we saw a kind of uh, opportunity of, and an abundance of free and brightly colored material. Um, and this kind of thinking is how we think about things uh, and this through line that we have um, through our practice, uh, making good from bad, um, looking at opportunity instead of focusing on uh, the errors made in the process. Next, uh, this is us. Uh, back in 2012, we've labeled ourselves, uh, in case you don't recognize us from 10 years ago. Um, we were fresh, uh, we were curious, uh, we were adventurous, and uh, most definitely broke. Um, 
pictured here is the first attempt uh, at working with a detergent bottle uh, number five plastic HTPE, uh, and uh, we were melting it with wax in the beginning. Um, next slide. Uh, and this is the finished product. Uh, this is our first, very, very first prototype. Uh, it kind of caught me out, caught me off guard when I looked, when I saw it, because I had forgotten about it. Um, and actually, funny story, it was stolen off of our front porch, uh, probably the the first night after we made we had made it, and we we realized, oh, someone someone thought it was valuable, <laughs> and we realized it was a good thing. Um, and so since we had this abundance of colorful, robust, high performance material, um, the barrier to transforming this material was, uh, labor and machinery. Um, next slide. So first labor, next slide. Uh, after the initial gathering of household plastic items, uh, we contacted a local uh, recycling center uh, about their plastic. Uh, this is a photo of, oh, go next. That's no, okay, we can go back. Okay. Um, so what we found out is that colored plastic is uh, basically worthless. Um, it, it was getting shipped off to China at the time. Uh, and we, they gave us an entire U-Haul's worth for free. Um, granted, we had to sort through it and sort through the uh, kind of uh, gnarly uh, garbage of the recycling center. Next. Um, breaking down the plastic requires sorting, cutting down, shredding, uh, washing and drying. Um, and this was our uh, first initial uh, go at it. The sorting process. Just oh, a quick, oh, I just want to make a quick uh, anecdote about the, uh, the pile of, of trash. Um, so, um, you know, and if you, Rachel, do you go back? I think there's a picture of that later. Oh, I'm sorry. But sorry, never mind. But Rachel, you guys are on it. Carry on. <laughs> All good. Um, so the sorting process uh, reveals kind of an interesting uh, color wheel of uh, what we see as post-consumer HDPE. And you see a lot of uh, a lot more reds and oranges uh, and blues and not a lot of uh, pinks and purples and yellows and greens, obviously. Um, next, we take that plastic and uh, our first go at it, we used a paper shredder, um, kind of converted into a little mini monster with our cardboard here. Um, after that process, next slide, uh, we get this. And this is our raw material uh, that has been shredded up and uh, prepared for us to use. And Simon, next slide, if you wanna tell that story, go ahead. Oh, sure, thanks, thanks Jimbo. I was getting ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, we were working in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, after we collected this material from, um, from the recycling center, we put it out on this lawn space in order for us to be able to then start sorting it. Um, and as soon as we put it out there, it was, uh, uh, we, we, we immediately got calls and complaints from the neighbors. Uh, people were really mad that we had dumped this, this uh, big pile of trash on it. And it was a problem. Um, next slide. But when we arranged it and in a, a, in a, in a very simple kind of color wheel, um, the same people that were calling to complain uh, were, were bringing their children to take photos. They loved it. They were asking us about the process. They, were, um, they saw it as art. And um, that was a big learning moment, um, I think, for all of us because we realized 
Okay, just as a designer, just by looking at material, by sorting it by color, just at, um, putting a little, using our eyes, using uh, this first level of sorting, um, we can start to transform it into something that um, is, is valuable and interesting to people. So, thanks. Yeah, I would, I would say something about that intention um, and in relation to color really changes uh, people's perceptions about, uh, about value, um, which was an interesting and learning point for us. Uh, I, next slide. I think, oh, yeah. I think even that, um, not that there's like value and less that there's value inherently in the material, but more that there's value in the eye of the designer or the handcraft. Um, and something that was not readily perceivable until we made it happen. Okay, sorry. No worries. Um, once we had the material, uh, we needed to figure out how to make stuff out of it. And this is where we uh, started to make uh, machines. And our first attempt, uh, which was, as I mentioned earlier, exhibited at the 2012 Venice Biennale. Uh, we had, we titled it Making Friends. Um, next slide. These are our friends all gathered together. Um, <laughs> next slide. These friends were made through a very painstaking process of applying melted plastic uh, that came out of uh, an extruder uh, and applying it to cardboard. Uh, and we kind of created different patterns, different textures using different tools um, and used, as Rachel had mentioned earlier, uh, the designer's eye. Uh, and Next slide. Um, this is the extruder that we used. And it's made up of, uh, it's made up of hardware store parts. And we did that purposely so that uh, things could be accessible. Um, the auger is using a uh, auger bit from the hardware store and uh, the uh, pipe material that the auger fits in is made out of black pipe, uh, which is what you would use for plumbing and whatnot. Um, next slide. This is the uh, pooped out molten plastic. Uh, and I believe this, this uh, mixture is uh, Tide bottles. Uh, next slide. Sometimes we used, uh, or most of the time, or all the time, sorry, uh, we used tools to texture because the plastic is very hot. Uh, and so uh, we use different kinds of tools. Sometimes we use pliers, sometimes we used uh, steel pipe to kind of roll it out to make these textures. Uh, next slide. And, oh, sorry, go, go back. And, this was maybe uh, the first instance of uh, how we did something wrong. Um, and we had visited uh, some injection molders and uh, plastic extruders uh, who uh, are based out of Detroit. Uh, and they told us uh, that we were doing it all wrong. Uh, basically, uh, our extruder wasn't mixing correctly um, it wasn't pushing the plastic all the way out to the sides. Uh, and this gets really expensive, obviously, because uh, these are all custom built parts made specifically for um, handling this man-made material. Um, but however, it gave us a kind of opportunity to um, make uh, a material that wasn't homogenous. And you can see here, um, this is a, uh, we call this the Mulder technique. 
uh, named after our one and only Rachel. <laughs> um, and she, I actually, we'll have a close up of it later on, I think. Next slide. This is the extruder from a different point of view. Uh, you can see the hopper and the, uh, and the rainbow plastic that we use. Next slide. Um, this is a tabletop made from that process of extrusion. Uh, we would take uh, extruded material, place them vertically, uh, and kind of place them along to make this uh, large tabletop piece. Um, next slide. And we actually kind of took a slice off the top and you can see, you can kind of start to see the different colors uh, during transition. Uh, on your bottom right, there's a good corner of red transitioning into yellow. Uh, there's some towards the bottom center, there's some white transitioning into pink. Um, and these are, uh, I guess, in an industrial setting, these parts would get thrown out usually. Uh, they, when they change colors, it's deemed as uh, imperfect and it gets thrown out. Um, but we took that as an opportunity. Uh, and this is a very close up shot of uh, the molder technique uh, that we showed earlier, but you can see kind of the rainbow uh, Superman of Superman ice cream of colors. Um, and this was done by uh, using only transitioning plastic. So we were kind of mixing colors in the hopper and then taking that out uh, and splitting that piece of molten plastic apart and uh, applying it to that mold. Uh, next slide. We also used it on uh, this piece that we called the Ugly Duckling, uh, which is made up of all of the uh, transition uh, plastics that uh, when we were using to transition the colors. And uh, you can kind of see on the, uh, the bill of the Ugly Duckling uh, that was transitioning from uh, yellow to green. Next slide. And some other examples of that technique that we were using. Uh, there was a rainbow cone uh, and then the uh, backside of uh, Lil Bro that we called. Next slide. This is another picture of all the, the friends gathered together. This was before the, uh, the actual exhibition. So we were just kind of putting them in a corner. Um, next slide. Again, this is a, uh, outside the uh, Arsenale. Next slide. So we learned a lot from that process and we took that uh, one of our favorite processes, which was uh, taking a piece of plastic and kind of uh, exposing it with the uh, rainbow colors inside. Uh, and we decided to make one larger uh, sculpture piece. Um, and his name was Rainbow. Um, we built a better machine. Uh, so this was uh, version two of our extruder, kind of beefed up the steel a little bit. Um, Next slide. And I always forget how long we spent on this, but it was, uh, Rachel, do you remember? It was three days nonstop. It was sleeping in chest. Yeah, that's, that's probably why I forgot. <laughs> um, yeah, we worked on it three days nonstop, uh, taking shifts um, because it was such a, and that wasn't really, that was just because of the, the deadline that um, they had asked us. Uh, and we said yes, and we had like a week to do it. So <laughs> these are some uh, close up shots. You can see it's 
in the middle of the night. Uh, and then we rented a van and drove out to Chicago to show it at one of the uh, furniture expositions. Next slide. This is Rainbow uh, pictured at the uh, Grand Central Station in Detroit. And we had, next slide. Uh, we had also designed Rambro to kind of sit on his back uh, to be able to turn into a bench. Next slide. Mm. And there it okay. is, eight, eight foot tall Rambro. So um, the Rambro process taught us about the successes and the shortcomings of injection handcraft techniques. And it kind of fueled a desire to continue to experiment with different types of production techniques. Um, one that was maybe a little bit more hands-off. And so we decided to try our hand in mold making, um, both to have a further away experience with making things out of plastic, but um, also be able to fabricate an, something that is only plastic, so without a cardboard substructure. Here it is. But this required making more machines, so we made an oven um, like this one. And we also made something to go in it. Um, called a roto molder, which I'm trying, uh, which turns the mold in all directions to create a hollow form. So that was the machine. We also experimented with mold making techniques. So this is Simon inflating um, a mold we made from heavy gauge aluminum foil. And this process was meant to make a quick mold with the least amount of waste possible. So it's just folded in half and then inflated. And through this mold making process, we were able to make objects at all different sizes and even start to think about them as domestic objects, like these lamps, um, and experiment with color and effects in a different way. So this is a mixture of two different types of post-consumer plastic, one that was injection molded and one that was blow molded. And so the injection molded one smeared and the blow molded plastic kind of stayed as speckles. Um, we could scale up like this, um, totem of uh, pillows and start to think about even um, bigger objects. Like uh, we had uh, an opportunity to show at the Shenzhen Biennale where we wanted to make extra large objects stuffed with domestic plastics. We created a large cage to rotate, um, to suspend the pillow mold in the cage and rotate it over heat. Um, and make huge pillows streaked with color from tablecloths and um, plastic bags. This is Simon. And just some photos of the results and also illuminated. Um, okay, so if the pillows were thin walled, evenly dispersed uh, color objects. We also had a desire to make something that was like very rigid and intentionally patterned with some more control over the patterning. So TT and M uh, <laughs> was a competition entry for the Battery Park Chair Contest. Um, we were inspired by the alphabet by Bruno Minari where the letters are made from discrete primitive shapes. So we made our own alphabet that could be a chair and a typeface, a typeface to sit on. Um, 
So another, another try at a hands-off process, but this one was a self-heating mold um, with air compression. And because it wasn't moving, we could intentionally make patterns of plastic. As you can see, I'm, I was making stripes. Um, and then the heated mold and the pressure would make a solid object that was in the shape of the primitive. Um, because the pieces were solid, they could be machined. Um, this is a picture of our machine after machining one of the pieces. Um, uh, because the piece was composed only of plastics, we were able to collect these shavings and use them again in later projects. And then we could use our repeated shape to weld together to make TT and eventually it could be a seat. Um, this is a close up of some of the surface um, patterning and the quality from the machining. Um, this particular piece was made from plastic like Folgers coffee cans, tie bottles and mustard containers. Um, and here the TT is with the M bench um, in a different colorway. Okay. So the process of TT were the start of an adventure into kind of more understandable and relatable domestic objects. Um, so we continued to co explore and evolve compression solid molds to think about these objects like mirrors. Um, and this was also our first kind of, we, the, when we started to incorporate more industrial waste products rather than consumer post-consumer plastics. So we began to acquire plastic from auto, manu man auto manufacturers, um, such as the white plastic in this mirror. But the process of the solid pieces was generated first by a, a desire to create dimensional lumber, um, something that could incorporate more traditional woodworking techniques uh, and use things like physical fasteners instead of something like heat welding or glues. Um, so this particular uh, bench was constructed with, um, with decking screws but it still had a beautiful quality of patterning um, like this joined surface. Um, eventually, we were able to make large slabs of this material um, and it made a sheet that could be cut, milled and processed much like plywood. Um, this project here was in a collaboration with Temple Children, um, which we showed in San Francisco along with these panel um, paintings uh, with the artist Meg. And uh, another version was our first commercial project for the Store Today clothing. Um, this is a picture of the surface patterning through CNC milling. Um, another shot. Uh, we made three mirrors for them. Um, but ultimately kind of was refined into these last versions with um, other materials, lights, um, and kind of three-dimensionality. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm jumping in. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so this is a continuation of our thinking about <clears throat> objects and making objects that um, one that people can um, can kind of understand and uh, appreciate a, at a glance, and 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 also that um, that can be affordable enough that uh, like our friends and family who who have supported us, um, you know, could could afford to to buy. A piece that we make you know we've been making all these big pieces with very really really long craft processes um but they were kind of too they were prohibitively expensive um so th these are um our pan fried stools and that we we made this as part of a um a residency at the museum of contemporary art in detroit 
And the uh, idea was that we can use um, already existing used cookware um, that we got at a Salvation Army and to, in order to make, um, to act as a mold for us to heat up the plastic. And then we would be able to kind of mush in um, very simple lumber legs um, to make a stool that is um, is simple, is 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 rough, but also um, people get immediately. They understand it, and even if they're not making it themselves, they can I, they can see. Oh, this is this is something that can be made. People can work with this material. Um, uh, next slide. Um, one of the the kind of basic ideas in, in this process is that we can take a, a pan and then use the different flakes that we've um, we've gathered and kind of make these one-off. Um, totally unique patterns um, that are done in in um, very, very playful kind of painterly way, um, and then we can make these uh, basically these series of pieces that are are unique. Everyone is uh, everyone is unique, and and um, it's it's the opposite of how people make plastic in industrially where it's everything is exactly the same. There's no originality. I mean, the material just kind of um, it's, it's a it's a single color that acts as branding, um, but doesn't go beyond that. Um, so this is our stools are one of the uh, the projects that we um, we had a lot of uh, just we we loved and we had a lot of success with. So we were able to later uh, partner with a local um, Detroit furniture company named Floyd um, to release a limited edition run where we blended. Um, the post-consumer plastic waste with waste that we had um, that we had sourced from the automotive industry. So we were able to make a kind of new material that was very specific to Detroit, the automotive industrial um, uh, uh, scene here, um, and then make something that people could live with and live with in a in a in a safe way that kind of speaks to change and speaks to material reuse. Um, one of the other uh, kind of pro products that we made along this line um, were our clocks. So in the same way, we're, we would be able to use very simple molds that we would then heat up in a, in a industrial ventilated uh, lab oven. And each of these clocks could be a kind of register of the materials that went into it. And it can be a register of a, a you know a little a flash of kind of creative inspiration and how we want to kind of translate a waste material into um, something that has patterns, something that is that is beautiful, something that people would would want to see and um, tell a story about. So this has been one of the really just underlying rewarding aspects of our practice of. When we, you know, we'll find a different material and we'll mix it together um, and make some new new pieces that are um, are always unique. Um, just a, a quick aside um, in the way that we kind of like to work collaboratively. Um, the those colorful little um, threads in this piece um, they're from uh, uh, another Detroit artist who is a weaver and she weaves with a traditional. Um, she's a traditional Oaxacan um, weaver and um, uses these plastic threads, which are incredibly common. I'm sure people have seen it if, if, if they ever uh, traveled in Mexico, um, but she didn't really have anything to do with the scraps. So we had a collaboration where she donated the scraps. We made these, we made these pieces that kind of fuse both of those things together. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I thought it was it's one of my favorite pieces. It's really, um, because I, I appreciate her work so much and uh, it's, yeah, it's really nice to be able to combine different um, aesthetics, different practices kind of under the guise of recycling and, and re, um, reuse. Um, next slide. So um, we have a lot of fun making objects um, and selling things and um, but we've known kind of from the the beginning that it's that's not uh, it's not our it's not our goal to become a company that sells a bunch of plastic things. That's not that's not what inspires us. We don't want to scale to be a giant plastic producer, and, and uh, um, that's that's really not what interests us. Um, what interests us is looking 
critically at, at a problem and seeing it as an opportunity to make something new and to use art and creativity to tell some new stories, to inspire people, um, and to also help a lot in our in our communities. <clears throat> so one of the ways that we try to engage in this is really by looking at place. Um, um, plastic is a global material, and um, it's if you just look at it in a in a in a vacuum, um, you kind of miss the whole story. So. In um, the summer of 2019, we were really, really lucky to be invited to take part in a, um, in a residency with Temple Children um, that was focused on the plastic that washes up on the shore at uh, Camilo Beach um, on the Big Island. So uh, Plastics of Beach is the, the, the title that we eventually came up with for the exhibition of these, these, these items. Um, next slide. But it started with, um, uh, after arriving, um, we were able to get a ride down to Camilo, which is, I'm sure as anyone who's done it is, um, you can attest is already a kind of otherworldly experience driving, tr trying to actually get out there. It's such a um, remarkable, um, remarkable environment. Um, but finally, when we got to the beach, we were we were um, absolutely stunned with the amount of plastic pieces uh, that we found in the sand. Um, the next slide is a uh, um, image of Rachel kind of hand picking and hand collecting um, uh, this material. And um, I know for anyone who is who is who lives on Hawaii, um, you this isn't anything new. I'm sure that you've seen. You know, you've seen this and you're acquainted with it, um, but it was really, really remarkable um, for us to see it and, and really shocking to um, be able to pull, you know, pull your hand through a little bit of sand, a little bit of the beach, and it would be, it would be filled with plastics. Um, and uh, it was really um, made a big impression on us. And um, yeah. We in the in the next slide you can see this this item which is um, a, a material that has recently I think in 2013 it was it was kind of officially officially identified and acknowledged as a new material. It's called um, plastic lamarette, and it's this combination of of plastic that has been um, melted together with um, with shells, with sand, with organic matter, and it's something that now is exists on beaches uh, all over the world um, because of the way that um, plastic waste travels through our waterways. Um, so this is just one of the really scary artifacts of, of um, our kind of contemporary uh, uh, dealing with, with this material. Um, next slide. So um, what we did um, during, the re during the residency is um, in a very similar way to how we began uh, working in Ann Arbor and in Detroit, um, we, let, we, made a big, we made a big mess, we made a big pile of, of, of this material. And then in the next slide, you can see um, we have a video of us, of us sorting it, doing the same, uh, the same process of um, just working with the material as as designers, as craftspeople, um, engaging with it, classifying it, trying to understand it, um, and also to um, arrange it in a way that we would then be able to make it into, um, remake it into um, compelling pieces of art. So this is, um, uh, not quite finished, but um, an almost finished color wheel of the of the um, plastic we found. You can see all the different types of plastic that have come from, you know, really from all over the world. Um, so for this residency, we were really interested in the idea of we're fo focusing on this really gl ugly global, you know, anonymous uh, plastic problem. But then thinking about how um, how it becomes incredibly local when it gets to the the um, 
the places that the places that it ends up are these very specific places that have very specific ecosystems and relationship to nature. Um, even the you know the specific tides that that make Camilo Beach actually you know historically such a special place. Um, you know all of these things are are really the um, the uh, the beauty of the environment. Um, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to do, have some of that storytelling be in the pieces. So we took a uh, foil and we went to different um, uh, different locations uh, on the island and made these relief molds of different rocks and different geological um, kind of outcroppings. And we made these little um, we made these little molds, which would then have the actual the actual formal structure of of the geology of the island. And we're thinking that, okay, if we're able to now remake part of the geology um, using some of the plastic we found, we can start to bring together the story of this, this material that uh, nobody wanted, nobody wanted here, um, but is, is, is definitely here, you know? And how, so how do we make a story to kind of combine those that, um, un that unfortunate reality? Um, so we filled our, we filled our molds, and we made a very um, kind of simple, primitive um, makeshift oven. And the next slide, you can see um, this is the, a very um, lo-fi setup for making these one-off pieces. Um, the next slide. And you can see we started to, in the same way, act in a, in a kind of paint, take a painterly approach to the material, filling the molds, um, and then we made these pieces that um, really, I think, communicated a lot of the um, the kind of ugly beauty of this. Uh, the uh, basically trying to trying to juxtapose um, geological formations with this kind of uh, deceptively se seductively beautiful material. Um, into these these kind of fragment sculptures that we um, we displayed, we exhibited with Temple Children at the East Hawaii Cultural Center in the show uh, Kindred Spirits. Um, we can go to the um, the next the next slide. So um, that was a that was an example of us working on the Big Island and trying to um, take a really quick uh, engagement with place. Um, this last summer, we were able to do a project in Detroit, which was able to speak to a lot of our a lot of our values and a lot of our um, really what what we're trying to do as a practice. And this was um, this was uh, called Transforming Trash Detroit, which is a, a a pilot program for the kind of larger work that we'll be hoping to to do in um, with communities in Hawaii. So um, we're next slide. What we were able to do was we were able to set up a community workshop where we were, we held um, design workshops with um, Detroit youth and um, also um, older community members as well. Um, but it was it was all about um, education and teaching people about what plastic is, how it can be recycled, and how um, if you're creative and if you if you engage with the material, you can make something new. So um, in the next slide, um, we hosted a community uh, plastic drive where we had a, we set up um, pickup stations for material, and we worked with um, local laundromats who had been throwing away all of their all of the um, the waste that was generated in their business, and we were able to um, get that same pile of, of 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 trash that working with these kids. Um, they were able to then okay sort into a into a color wheel, and which is something that was um, so uh, surprisingly exciting and fun for them um, because it's such a visceral way of of engaging with um, with color and with material, and then just seeing this material that they've been surrounded with their whole lives, um, really seeing it in a new way. So um, the next slide. Um, we did the same process of filling molds. Uh, the young people were able to uh, work with the, the plastic pellets and then arrange and make these make these designs um, and then uh, 
we did all the baking. This is um, in, in some of our in our earlier work, we were a little more like cavalier with safety measures, but um, we actually have a really um, we've evolved and we have a safety is like a very high priority for us. So um, none of the kids were working with any hot plastic. They weren't working with um, anything that could have been um, harmful to them. Um, in the next slide. And so for, to culminate, uh, we made um, all these tiles where we were able to take the, the waste plastic that we, had, that we had gathered through the summer and we were able to melt it um, and make these, uh, these tile formations, which then, um, next slide, which then we, we crafted into this uh, 12 foot long bench which was then installed in a local park. And you can see uh, two of the participants just kind of uh, proudly posing on, on the work they made. Um, this, this work, uh, this bench has a, um, a metal aluminum skeleton underneath, so it's able to be very robust and, um, and, can, and, and very supportive of, of weight. Um, but yeah, this was, a, uh, this was the culmination of, of our small summer um, summer design workshops and it was a it was a big success and not only in making something that could now live in the community but in bringing people together in teaching kids about design teaching kids about technology and really making kids believe that they can be designers and they can be artists and and, and they have some agency over the materials that are in their world so um, those are some of the things that we we want to, um, yeah, we want to bring to any work we, we are, are doing in the future and especially with um, work that we do with you in Hawaii. So. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. So for the East Hawaii Cultural Center, thank you so much and good night to all. We look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>